let's go ahead and take a look at how we can set up some of these retention stages uh, and the other information management policies. Now again, same deal. If we come in here to our site settings page, we could, if we wanted to, define some settings that we're going to use um, throughout our site collection. If we come in here to site collection policies, we can define information management policies that we can then reuse throughout the site collection. We can also do it on an individual list, or in this case, library basis. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the library settings page. And in my library settings page, we have a link that says information management policy settings. And we basically have four kinds of policies that we might want to define. Okay, we've got, well, first we're going to choose a content type, right? Because this library is using two content types the document content type and the folder content type. So we're going to say that we want to define some policies for the document content type. Okay, so the first thing is we can give it a description, talk, talk a little bit about what the policy is for, what does it define. We can also give a policy statement. Okay, the policy statement is actually displayed to end users so that they can see. You know, and, and the policy statement is generally going to be something that's a little more formal than just the description. Um, it should also define you know, if, if, if the policy is in response to some legal um, purpose, maybe, a, again, a regulation or a law that you're required to comply with. Again, that's really what we should we should put in the policy statement. Also, if there are things that you know are really important that people need to know about, such as you know this document cannot be shared or downloaded or things like that. So that's what our policy statement should be. And then we see the four different things that we can define in our information management policy settings. Okay, so we can define retention. So this is really you know, the root of it. This is where we define our stages. This is how we can define file actions that should occur at different points in a document's life cycle. Let's take a look at how that works. If we enable retention, okay, you'll notice here it's going to tell us that we need to add a retention stage. Okay, so that's, that's how we define our retention policies. You'll also notice down here where it says records, we, we, if we want to, we can define different retention stages for records. Okay, and so we've got some flexibility there. Um, but in this case, we're just going to say, we're going to leave the default here that says use the same retention policy as non-records. Okay, but we do have that flexibility where we can could, we could really get very robust here and we could define retention stages and actions that will apply to non-records and different ones that would apply for files that had been declared as records. So let's just go in here and add a retention stage and see how this works. So basically, creating these stages is really pretty simple. You have to define two things. One, which date property of the library is going to, de is going to define the stage. So what we see here is we see the stage is based off a date property on the item. And then in this dropdown, we're going to see any available date columns from the library itself. Okay, so what we're seeing here are really the system managed ones, right? The created date, the modified date, the declared record date. If we wanted to, if we had added maybe through content types or a list column, if we had added an additional date column to this library, we would see that available as well. Um, but maybe we've got a situation where we're going to say that uh, maybe um, one year after the modified date. So what that means is we want to have it set up to where if this file or if any file in this library is not modified for a year, right? So it gets modified and then a year goes by, then we're going to say, okay, we're going to move that to an archive location because 
we don't necessarily need to leave it there. It's not being edited anymore, and maybe this is like a working library, something like that. So we would say the time period is the modified date, and we're going to say one. And of course, in addition to year, we could choose days or months. So we'll say one year after it's been modified. Now, of course, if it's modified and then a week later and it's modified again, that modified date gets updated, and so of course that year you know kind of starts over. But that's the first thing we define for a retention stage. Is it's it's called the event, but it's basically the date driven thing that will say, okay, we have reached this stage. So we're saying that one year after a file is modified, we have met this stage. And then we define the action. Okay, so here are the different actions that we can use. Right? So we could move it to the recycle bin. We could permanently delete it, which just means that we're going to delete it without putting it through the recycle bin. We could transfer it to another location. So this might be what we want to do in this example where you know, we want to be able to go in and, and say that I want to move it to archiving within my record center. Now you notice says there are no registered destination locations for the site. And that's because I haven't set up um, a, an external service connection. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So that's one thing that I would need to do first if I wanted to define this action as moving to another location. Okay? We could start a workflow. Okay? We, this could be um, this could be a custom workflow. Could also be one of the out of the box approval or one of the out of the box workflows. Probably not the approval workflow, but there is an out of the box workflow that we might use with this, and it's called the disposition approval workflow. And that workflow is set up to allow uh, the workflow participants not to approve or reject content changes to a file, but rather to essentially approve the scheduled disposition or scheduled action for an item upon reaching a retention stage. So that's usually the kind of workflow that we would use if we selected start a workflow. But again, we could also use a custom workflow. Um, we could skip to the next stage. So maybe at this point, we're just going to we're not going to do anything. We're just going to start the next stage. We could manual or we could automatically declare the file as a record. Okay, we could delete. Um, all previous versions or only the draft versions. Okay, so there are different things, different actions that we can do to a document once it reaches the event that we've defined at the beginning of the stage. And that's really how we how we work with these these retention stages. And it's a matter of just coming in here, selecting that we're going to enable retention, and then adding and, and defining the different stages. And if we wanted to define different retention stages for records, okay, you'll notice that the actions, well, the events are basically the same, and the actions are almost the same. Obviously, one that we don't see here is declare as a record, right? Because obviously, it would, these would only apply to those items that were already records. And so this enable retention policy setting is going to be a big part of putting in some more robust document management. And this really lets you put in place some automation in terms of what we want to happen to documents as they reach different steps or different stages in their life cycle, with each of those stages being defined by a specific date. We can also enable auditing. Auditing is a, a really, can be a really important thing, because what this is going to allow us to do is tell SharePoint to keep track of and let us see in a report any of the events that we choose to audit. So maybe we want to keep track of when people open or download documents, or when they view items in a list, or when they view the item properties, when they edit documents, when people check out or check in documents, when someone moves or copies a file to another location, or when someone deletes or restores from the recycle bin. And so we can set all of these different auditing options, or none of them. We can enable barcodes. Okay, now, when we enable barcodes, what we're really doing is you know, we're not turning uh, SharePoint into you know, a, barcode, a barcode scanner or a barcode reader. What we're basically doing is, letting, is essentially telling SharePoint to create a unique identifier that, that translates to that barcode itself. And then what it will do is it will generate an image of the barcode that can be inserted inside of the document itself. 
right? So if you if you're an organization that maybe you you know you you, you track documents by barcodes, this is something else that we can use. We can also enable labels. Okay, labels allow us to take properties from SharePoint, from in this case the library, um, and we can then embed those documents into Office. Uh, I'm sorry, embed those properties into Office documents. Um, so maybe, for example, we want to um, show the SharePoint version number inside of a document. What we would need to do would be we would define a label for that particular property. So maybe like version, and we simply put the, the version property number in here. Okay, and once we've done that, of course you notice we can also you know, make some changes to how that will appear. If we click refresh and we see something down here like this, it means we've got it in there right. right? So we've, we've identified the property that we want in a way that SharePoint recognizes. And so now we could, we could go in and we could embed that label through the quick parts you know, in Microsoft Word or something. I'll show 